Today's speaker is now employed by <clears throat> Archaeology Southwest. He came down to Tucson after uh, to work on a, a postdoc with Archaeology Southwest and the um, School of Anthropology down in Tucson at U of A, and the Southwest Social Networks uh, National Science Funded uh, Research Program is the basic uh, source of the information that you'll be hearing about tonight. And I find Matt's, for a young guy, uh, the amount of experience and the diversity of his uh, past experience in the archaeological world, I, I am continually impressed. So I, I hope you'll enjoy very much as Matt talks about how migration transformed social networks in the late pre-Hispanic Southwest. Matt. Hi, can everybody hear me pretty well through the microphone? So as Bill said, you know, I've only been down in Tucson for coming up on two years now, but I was here in uh, Arizona State University was where I got my PhD. So this is a little bit of a homecoming for me to come back to the Phoenix area. So I'm glad to be here and glad to see people I know and some people I don't know, and especially glad to see some people I saw out at the expo, the archaeology expo on Saturday. So that's great to see you out here. So as Bill, Bill said, the research I'm going to talk about today comes out of the Southwest Social Networks Project, which is this large collaborative project uh, involving Archaeology Southwest, University of Arizona, and researchers from several other different places. And I've got these handouts that I handed out. And you can see there's some in color, some in black and white on the table. And I just want to take a moment. On the, on the front page, I have a list of uh, many of the people that were involved in this project. So I want to acknowledge that what I'm going to talk about today is not just solely my work. This is the work of a large collaborative team of people. The PIs on this project were uh, Dr. Barbara Mills from Air University of Arizona School of Anthropology and uh, Jeff Clark at Archaeology Southwest. So this is a big team. You know, we were archaeologists. We had sociologists involved. We had computer scientists. We had uh, one geochemist, uh, map making specialist, and ge geographic information specialist. So this is a large and diverse group of people. So every, you know, you can't do this kind of work without lots of people involved, and that's something I want to sort of point out from the, the very beginning. And this was a multi-year project. This is the fourth year, I believe, that this project's been going on, and we're sort of moving into the next stage of that uh, now as well. So the title of the project is the Southwest Social Networks Project. So I'm going to kind of start by talking about what exactly is a social network. And you know, in the age of Facebook and things, and I'm sure a lot of you are on that, people probably have a general concept of what that might mean. But the best way to uh, sort of explain this is just to give an example. So I'll start with a bunch of dots on this board. And these are going to represent people. So this can be. This is Fred, Bob, Joe, John, Eugene, I don't know. And every one of these people has a set of relationships with every one of these other people that I've, that I've drawn on here. So we'll say this person knows and interacts with this person. So we'll draw a line between these two. This person knows and interacts with this person. We'll draw a line there. The same back here, and so on. So what we end up with is a characterization of a number of individuals and their relationships. So this, this is in the most basic level, this is what a social network is. So it's basically a set of units that could be people, they can be firms, organizations, and the relationships between them. So we're defining the formal relationships. And when we, when we graph it out this way, this is what we call a social network graph. And these are becoming increasingly common, and I've, I've kind of been keeping track of this for a while. And you can see that you know th this is becoming so commonplace that they're starting to use it in newspaper articles on a regular basis, talking about like what actor was in what movie with whom, and, and for example, things like that. So these dots, which archaeologists and other network analysts uh, refer to as nodes, uh, can be, like I said, people. They can be an entire settlement. They could be a family. They could be a computer in a, in a, in a computer network. They could be a city. And the lines between them can be any kind of relationship. It could be a road between two cities. It could be just some pattern of interaction. They exchange they exchange items or money. This could be just that they know each other. It could be a network of acquaintance, for example. So really all this is, a social network is a very, very broad concept that's just the formal representation of relationships among some set of actors. And what I'm going to talk about today is how we're 
applying some of the models and methods that come out of this broad multidisciplinary uh, body of research to archaeological research. So the first thing I want to kind of talk about is what are networks good for? Um, you know, as, as we can see here, you know, one example is they're good for formally defining interactions and also visualizing those interactions. So if you look at the handout that I handed out, you can see uh, this one that looks like it's sort of a blue explosion and a red explosion with a bunch of lines going between. Um, so what that actually is, is that is a study that was done on political bloggers leading up to the 2004 presidential election. So the blue dots are uh, uh, liberal bloggers as, as defined by themselves. The red dots are conservative bloggers as defined by themselves. And you can see there's lines between all these. And those are when one blog links or mentions another blog. So you can see there's a lot of these blogs are mentioning each other uh, through time. And the lines that are red or blue are relationships where a liberal blogger is mentioning another liberal blogger. The red lines are a conservative blogger mentioning another conservative blogger. And the yellow lines are when one's mentioning the other. So you can see there's a lot more people sort of talking among their own group and not really a whole lot of people talking between groups. So there's, there's really this divide. There, there's almost two blogospheres, if you will, you know, between the liberal and conservative. And they're not communicating a whole lot. So by formally describing this, we can sort of get an idea of you know, what this picture looks like in this one particular time. And this was in the last four weeks leading up to the 2004 election. And they've actually redone this study consistently and actually show that you know, how this gets more or less to be the case, where there's this divide between uh, the different realms in, in terms of uh, who people are talking to and communicating with. So that just gives you an idea that you know, these social networks graphs can be useful just from a visual standpoint. You can get quite a lot of information by looking at something like that. That gives you a lot of information in a short amount of space. You know, you don't have to really be told. Once you understand what a network is, you understand what's going on there quite well. Um, the other thing that you can do with this is, is networks can really also tell you about the nature of relationships uh, among actors. And we can say which actors in a network, which nodes are the most important for determining certain kinds of flows, or, for example. So one that I'm sure a lot of you are aware of uh, is this, this idea called, called six degrees of separation, where you know every individual is said to be sort of connected to other people by six degrees or fewer. And my favorite version of this is the six degrees of Kevin Bacon, you know, where you can, you, you can start with uh, any actor and find your way to Kevin Bacon within uh, within six connections of people he's been in films with. So that's that's a network of people who are co-stars in films, and actually. You know, we live in the age of big data, where big databases are available and things like that. So the Internet Movie Database is this large database of actors and what movies they've starred in. So someone's actually done this and actually determined how central Kevin Bacon is in the network of movie stars. And what they actually found is that you can get to 90% of other actors that are in that database within fewer than four links, actually, from, from him. And he's still not the number one, he's not the most central actor in that database. That's actually Dennis Hopper. I looked that up, I looked that up today. So you, that's sort of an interesting example of you know, how that's sort of pervaded popular culture. This idea from social networks are really getting out there and or people are grasping. Because I, I think these are easy to grasp ideas that can encapsulate quite a lot of information in a small amount of space. So social and network analysis is also a set of tools. So there's. This has been going on, uh, social network analysis and different kinds of network analyses have been going on since the 60s or earlier in mathematics and sociology and other fields. And you know, we as archaeologists are, are coming to this relatively uh, recently. This is, this is really gaining popularity uh, recently for formal explorations of networks. And so there's already all these tools that people have developed for identifying which actors are the most important in different kinds of networks. And, for identifying, you know, if a network's likely to survive, expand, or collapse, for example. So we have all these, these tools. That's an important aspect of this. And I also want to say that social network uh, analysis is also a theoretical model. So the, the, it basically just says that if we know something about the relationships among some set of people, for example, uh, we might also uh, be able to predict how those relationships may develop or change through time. So this says, you know, the more we know about the relationships, the more we may know about how those relationships might develop and change. So look, looking at the handout again on uh, page one, on the top left, I have this other diagram that has the arrows and the, and the plots. So I don't know if this was uh, brave or stupid of me, but this is actually my own personal Facebook data that I downloaded and created a network of there. 
And you, you, can do the, you can do this yourself. So what this is is every friend in my Facebook network and who those people are friends with. So one thing that I thought was interesting when looking at this right away is that I don't know anyone that doesn't know at least one other person that I know. So you know that, that says something about me, I guess, right there, that I, you know, I'm not extending my digital friend list out to expand to people that are sort of peripheral to my group, for example. And also, when looking at this, you can see there's these four clusters that are different colors in there. And I, I noticed something right away when looking at this, that people on the right-hand side of this plot are mostly non-archaeologists. People on the left-hand side of this plot are mostly archaeologists. So at one level, that suggests, you know, archaeologists might be a little insular. We're kind of interacting with each other. I can't blame them for not knowing my friends that don't live anywhere near Arizona, you know. But it, it's sort of an interesting result. And also, there's these four other clusters. So you can see in the bottom right, uh, there's a group that's mostly made out of people from my hometown and my family. Uh, the top right, University of Texas, where I did my undergraduate degree. Those are mostly people there. And those are, those are connected. And I was actually surprised of people that knew each other that I had no idea in, in the process of doing this. Go over to the left side. That, this is graduate school at Arizona State University. You can see this dense cluster and University of Arizona. So, you know, for all the talk of rivalry between U of A and, and ASU, there's actually quite a bit of connection uh, between the two as evidenced here. And you can see right, at, right smack dab in the middle, there's one large red dot. And that's the most, what's known as the most central node in my network. And that's my wife, Melissa. So I, show, I showed this to her the other day when I made this. And I said, Melissa, look, you're the most central node in my social network. And she's like, I, I better be the most central node in your social network. <laughs> so you know, I, I think th this is a fun sort of example. And if anybody's interested in doing this on their own, I can, sh I can show you. You can actually have these generated automatically. And it, it's kind of a fun thing to play with. And, I think, you know, just like I was, you might be surprised of who knows who and, and how, they, how they may have been interacting, you know, in, in ways that you had no idea. So with that sort of example, I want to talk about now how we're using this in an archaeological context. So Bill mentioned briefly that we have uh, an issue of Archaeology Southwest back there that was focused on what's known as the Coalescent Communities Database. So this was this large database that was developed over many years uh, by many, many archaeologists, including people at Archaeology Southwest, that contains information on the size and dates of sites larger than about 12 rooms across the whole Southwest from AD 1200 to 1700. So this is a massive undertaking, a large number of sites. There's, there's about 4,800 sites in there currently. So a very, very large number of sites uh, throughout the Southwest. And this was a tool that was used to produce estimates of population and, and for other sorts of research questions that we're addressing. So that was sort of the starting point for the project that we're working on now, is we have this massive database of settlements, and we know how big they are and when they were occupied. The next thing we wanted to know was, what were the relationships among those sites through time, and how did those change through time and across space? So what we did is we added artifact data to this. So for a large number of these sites, we went through old CRM reports. We went through collections and actually reanalyzed collections in museums. Uh, we actually did in-field uh, ceramic analyses uh, and just built this enormous amount of uh, ceramic uh, type tabulations and also obsidian data. And so we, the total database, I'll give you the statistics here. So we've got 700 sites, 4.3 million ceramics, for sites west of the Continental Divide within the southwest and north, north of Mexico. So that's you know, a very, very large database of ceramic data from across this region. And we also have uh, what's probably now one of the largest uh, compiled databases of obsidian that's sourced to specific places. So obsidian's volcanic glass, and you can see the map on the right-hand side of page one, shows these known sources throughout the southwest and northern Mexico. So there's a number of sources about 50, in fact, throughout sort of northern Mexico and, um, and the U.S. southwest, uh, where we can trace obsidian through looking at the chemical signatures of trace elements and things back to these specific sources. So we've got about 6,000 samples from about 150 sites traced back to specific places. So this is the other big thing that we have in the database. So these two forms of data are, you know, the major, major source of uh, our analyses and the things that I'm going to talk about today. But I first want to just step back a little bit and talk about just the challenges in creating something like this and you know, what, it's, what it's taken. So as I said, this is compiled from both existing and new data. Um, 
you know, it was, there was more than a year of data gathering with students working on entering data and people directing them and finding the reports, finding these data sources, going out in the field, going to the museums. So a very long time spent on that. And then just about as long, just a little over a year, and actually cleaning up the data. Because, you know, every archaeologist has their own idea of, you know, is this snowflake black and white or is it Tularosa black and white? They have, you know, two archaeologists might give you a different answer. So we have to come up with the sort of least common denominators that are common across all archaeologists. You know, what are, what are the categories we're comfortable with identifying things um, that are reasonably consistent across the entire database? So that was a big task, and cleaning up the data, you know, uh, took quite a bit of time. And I, there's a lot of professional archaeologists here, so the other point that I want to make, too, is, you know, we have these data now, and there's lots of other research questions that could be addressed with these. So, you know, we have, we'd encourage you to contact us and talk to us about that as well. So when we're starting to do our network analysis, you know, I gave you the simple example here where we have people as nodes and whether or not they know each other are these lines, the connections between them. I, sh I talked about the political blogs and who's linking to who, and I talked about my Facebook friends and who's, who's friends with who. You know, things are a little bit different if we're looking at archaeological data because we can't go and talk to people and say, you know, who did you interact with, who did you know? We, we have to infer that through material culture, through artifacts. So I'm going to talk more specifically first about how we do that through ceramics, one way that we do that through ceramics. And then I'm going to move on and compare that to how we've studied these, these same processes through obsidian. So ceramic wares are um, mostly what I'm going to talk about today. So these are broad categories of ceramics that are defined based on both aspects of technology, so sort of how was the clay uh, prepared, how was the paste and temper uh, put inside, and also design. You know, what are the designs that are painted on these things? So it's both how they look and also how they're made. It's, it's aspects of both. These are really, really the broad categories uh, that we define, and types are the finer designations within ceramic wares in the Southwest. And on the bottom of page one on the handout, there's just a uh, picture to show you a range of some of the wares that are found in sites within the area that's the focus of our study here. So you can see, you know, these things are quite different from one another. They have, there might be some similar, similarities in the color or the shapes of vessels or things like that, but like if you look at all these things in combination, they're relatively distinct and different from one another. So these things are relatively easy to identify by archaeologists, but at the same point, I want to make, make the point that these are categories that archaeologists have created. We don't know that people had these same categories when they were looking at these in the past. You know, the people that made these might have not seen a difference between some of these that we see a really broad difference between. So that, that's something always to keep in mind. But we still argue, and the basis of our project is that similarities in these ceramic wares between communities are not random. These things just don't happen by chance. So instead, you know, if, if two sites have similar ceramic wares in similar numbers, that suggests maybe exchange, population movement, uh, that they're learning to make these things in the same context, or that they're, you know, they agree on certain uh, ways to cook, serve, and stu store food and other goods. So a lot of these are, you know, culinary vessels used in serving and, and storing food. So our idea is that if we see two sites that are quite similar in the wares that they're using and discarding, that suggests that they're more likely to have a relationship than two sites that have entirely different ceramic wares. You know, so this, this is sort of the leap you have to take with us there. But we're, we're basically arguing that you know, evidence of similarities in ceramic wares suggests that any of those different processes uh, I explained, exchange, population movement, um, or uh, con similar context of learning may be at play in that given context. So I want, I want to be clear, though, that we're not saying that individuals within a settlement necessarily directly interacted with every other settlement where we find similar wares, just they were more likely to have been inter interacting with those people than with people that are making and using quite different ceramic wares. So that's the inference we made. So as I said, you know, we can't go and talk to people and ask them, who are you interacting with? So by looking at these similarities, we're, we're using this as a proxy for who they might have been interacting with. So that's, that's the sort of way this analysis works. I want to step back a little bit now and talk about the context in which these analyses are taking place. So we're, we, we call this period the late pre-contact or late pre-Hispanic period. And that's basically the way we're using that term here, between about AD 1200 to 1500. So from the, from the late uh, period right up until just before uh, contact in the Southwest. So this is one of the most dynamic 
periods in the archaeology of the entire Southwest. There, there was a lot of things happening at this time. Um, and you look at the maps on page two, you can see a series of maps that show these little bubbles of population. And the darker the bubble on those maps, the more people were in that area. So this is based on that coalescent communities database again. And we can see, you know, how population changed through time by tracing the size of sites and their distribution through time. So I'm going to talk mostly about the area within Arizona and western New Mexico. That's, that's the focus of the Southwest Social Networks Project. So that's the focus of the patterns that I'm going to describe here. So if you look at the first two maps, you can see between 1200 and 1250, 1250 to 1300, people are dispersed across most, most of the region. There's some dense areas of population, but there's not really gaps between the northern southwest, northern Arizona, and the southern southwest. These areas are connected by places where there are fair numbers of people. So th this is sort of characteristic of this, this, this early uh, portion of the late pre-contact period. After uh, the 80-1300 map, you can see, however, that the Four Corners and northeastern Arizona are basically devoid of population the way we measure, that, me measure it here. And that transition actually probably took place sometime be between about 1275 and 1300. So at some point during that 25-year period, you know, less than a generation, people moved out of uh, the Four Corners in northeastern Arizona in large numbers. So this is a really, really, really big population movement. And they, w they ended up in a lot of different places. Some people have argued about the northern Rio Grande being a destination for many of the people that were in southwestern Colorado. And a number of researchers at Archaeology Southwest over the years have made a series of arguments about people in northeastern Arizona, what's known as the Cayenta region in northeastern Arizona, ending up in central and southern Arizona uh, in, in far western New Mexico uh, at, at this time. And how we, how we think about that, so we, we have this depopulation. And then shortly thereafter, you know, within a couple of years of when we think this depopulation occurred, Places like Safford, uh, the San Pedro River Valley, Point of Pines, if you've ever been up on the San Carlos Apache Reservation, we see new sites or portions of sites that appear uh, where people are making objects and architecture much like people had been in northern Arizona prior to this migration. So th this has been used to argue for a movement of people down. In some cases, they're joining existing communities. In other cases, they're setting up their own communities. But you can imagine this, this is going to be a level of diversity that people probably hadn't experienced in their lifetimes. You know, one, one classic example, you, you can think about, you know, there might be a migrant settlement that contains, you know, a, a large number of families, maybe 10 or 12 families living next to a group of locals who had been there for several generations. And their houses are quite different. The pottery they're making is quite different. But they're living literally, you know, from this side of the restaurant to the other side of the restaurant from each other. So they're, they're living right in each other's faces. And this, this, this was a sort of interaction that people hadn't really experienced prior to this in, for, for quite a long time. There's other periods of migration in the Southwest, but this was sort of unique for several generations at this time. Um, other things that are happening at this time is we see the emergence of many new uh, material cultural traditions, in particular ceramics, or things that we study quite a bit. So we see the emergence of what's known as Roosevelt Redware, Salado polychromes, uh, that appear to be initially uh, produced in areas that primarily have a lot of evidence for uh, northern migrants. So it's been suggested that at least for a few generations, migrants might have been responsible for much of the production uh, of this um, pottery type. And this pottery, Salado polychrome, has been seen as evidence for a newly emerging and rapidly spreading social or religious movement. So the, 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 this, is, this has been linked to a lot of other changes that have taken place. I'm talking about 1275 to 1300, right in there. So between, between those two maps. And uh, if you look on the bottom right of page one, that's an example of a cliff polychrome vessel, a salado polychrome, specific type within the salado polychrome tradition. So you know, the, 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 this is the context that I'm talking about. There's this massive migration. Lots of people are ending up in new places. And they're interacting with people that they probably hadn't interacted with much previously. So if we return to those maps again, we'll kind of continue with the story here. From 80, 1300 on, you can see population continues to contract. There's still really, really dense areas of population. But by 1350 or so, there's now a gap between the northern southwest and the southern southwest. So there's areas that have very, very low population densities between the northern and the southern southwest. And actually, by 1450, the way that we measure population here, we only have population 
up in the Zuni and Hopi areas. So, so we, don't, we don't have a lot of direct evidence of population in the southern southwest after this time. And this was actually over a 150 year period, about a 75% loss in population. So this is a huge loss in population in a relatively short amount of time. And as I said, you know, by 1450 or so, the only archeological, archeologically measurable population are in the Pueblo communities at Hopi and Zuni. So this is the context uh, in which our study is conducted. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about how we used the ceramic data that I described earlier to look at changes in relationships and interactions through, uh, through that major change in settlement that just occurred, that I just described. So the plots that you see right at the top above those maps, all the little colored bubbles with lines between them uh, that are labeled the AD 1250 to 1300, 1300 to 1350, and 1350 to 1400, uh, those are, every one of those dots on those maps is a site. So those are sites that are occupied at those times in our database and they're color coded based just on their region. So we're not making any sort of cult cultural designation based on these color codings. Those don't mean that they were different cultures or anything. That's just where they're physically located on the landscape. So this, 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 this just helps us think about how these things change through time and space. And when you see a line between two of those, that means that those two sites share a substantial portion of their ceramic ware. So that means 75% is the example that's used here. So that means they have 75% of the ceramics they're producing and using in common with every other site with which they're connected with a line. So this gives, you an, gives us an idea of patterns of strong similarity across the region as a whole. So if we look at that first map on the left, the 1250 to 1300, what we see there is a bunch of distinct blobs that are mostly one color. You know, so e each one of these areas is mostly a network that's made up of people that are primarily interacting with people that are in their own geographic zone. So people are mostly interacting with their close neighbors. So you can see the Phoenix Basin, a nice little red bubble. The orange and brown is the Tucson Basin and the nearby Papagaria area. We have the Tonto Basin in yellow and uh, the San Pedro in sort of the dark red and Safford in the lighter brown. So these areas are relatively distinct and self-contained. You know, so if, if we're thinking about what this means in terms of interaction, the processes that I described that move pottery and produce similarities in pottery are not really crossing these river valleys. They're mostly sticking within that. So this is the period right before this migration I talked about. So then we move to that AD 1300 period. So this is the first period right after that migration. And all of a sudden what we see is one really, really large cluster that where uh, strong similarities in ceramics are cross-cutting all of these different valleys in the southern southwest. So we have a lot of different interactions that are taking place that had pre among areas that had previously been relatively distinct. But you know, there's always gonna be holdouts. And we see, you see the Tucson, Papagaria area, and also Phoenix Basin. Phoenix Basin likes to be a holdout. Everybody in Phoenix likes to be different, always. And um, well, it's, it's still true to this day, I guess. And um, then we finally move to this last example. So 50 years later, about a couple of generations later, again, we see concentrations of uh, relationships between people in all these valleys throughout the southern southwest. And uh, again, you can see this little tail trailing off the edge, which is the Phoenix Basin sites. Again, they, you know, they're, they're, they're coming in a little bit, but they're still, they still want to be a little bit different from everything else that's happening. So, so what's really driving these, these similarities, these increasing similarities across the whole southern southwest is this Salado polychrome pottery that I was talking about. So that's becoming increasingly common, not just in these, these uh, landing zones where migrants had initially uh, arrived after 1275, but it's being produced and used much more widely after that, and, and it increases in its breadth through time. So what we're really seeing there is the creation of a new horizon that sort of spreads across all these areas that had previously been distinct. So th this is interesting in thinking about how interactions change. You know, we have people, new arrivals arrive in this area, and then they spread out into many different areas. And you know, those people are interacting with each other, all these new arrivals, and by doing so, they're also creating new ties between areas that had previously been uh, relatively distinct through time. So that's, that's what the ceramic data are telling us about patterns of networks uh, through time in the southern southwest. So now I'm gonna play this off our other da major data set, the obsidian. So again, obsidian's volcanic glass, and you can determine exactly where it's made based on trace elements. And, we have that map on page one um, that shows all the different obsidian sources, or most of the obsidian sources that are known in the southwest and northern Mexico. 
So we have, like I said, this large database of obsidian objects that we've traced back to these specific sources. So that really tells us about where people are going and getting things or how they're getting things through exchange uh, throughout the region as a whole. So another piece of information we have, of course, is the location of the sites themselves. We know where these sites were. We know where these things were recovered. So since we know where the obsidian sources are, we know where the sites are, we can estimate you know, what, would we, what would we expect people, where would we expect people to be getting obsidian. And you know, the first cut assumption you can make is that people are probably going to get things from areas that are relatively close by to them. So our, our initial assumption that we wanted to test was, are people getting obsidian from the sources that are closest to where they're living? So if you're sort of 50%, if you're halfway between two sources, do you have roughly 50% of those two sources? If you're really close to one source, do you have only that one source? Those are the kind of, kinds of questions we wanted to ask with the database. And what we found is prior to this period of migration that I've been talking about, so before the, the northern southwest um, migrants came down to the southern southwest, this, this is pretty much the case. In most, most times and places across the southwest, people are getting obsidian roughly proportional to how far those sources are from them. So they're, they're mostly getting things from things that are relatively close by, or if they have to go far, they're still going to the closer sources first. And there's one major exception to this uh, prior to the, to the uh, migration, which is the Zuni area, which is getting obsidian from the Jemez source more than we would expect. So you can, if Zuni's sort of in west central New Mexico, and you can see where Jemez is. So they're actually going further and getting obsidian from that further source more often than we would expect. So there's a huge shift in the way people are using and obtaining obsidian after um, the period of migration. So again, all these migrants come down into all these valleys in the southern southwest, and all of a sudden, everything changes. First of all, the frequency of, of obsidian uh, changes pretty dramatically, so it, by an order of magnitude or more. So obsidian used to make up about half a percent of a lot of lithic assemblages in the southern southwest in certain areas. It goes up to 5% or more in some areas. So this is, it's still not a huge amount, but it's a pretty big increase. That's sometimes by more than an order of magnitude. So uh, another thing that we see is that no longer are people necessarily getting obsidian from the sources that are closest to them. And in fact, more sites than not are getting obsidian from sites that are further away than we would expect. So people are going further to get this. There's more of it. So this sort of checks new exchange patterns that are developing across this, uh, across this region at the time. So for example, you can see this, the San Francisco Peaks um, uh, obsidian source drawn on the map up in the Flagstaff area. And that's quite frequent in the University Indian Ruin site in the Tucson area. So you know, that's quite a distance that these things are moving. So this is probably part and parcel of people moving, bringing these objects, and also new patterns of exchange developing at the time. Another major pattern that we see is that sources of obsidian in what we know as the upper Gila region, which Bill said is going to be this upcoming issue of Archaeology Southwest, is on this. So th these are the Mule Creek and Cow Canyon sources in southwestern New Mexico. All of a sudden, those sources are really becoming common in many, many of the areas where people have uh, argued that northern migrants are arriving. And they're most common in the sites, even in the northern southwest, that have high frequencies of this Salado polychrome pottery. So these two things seem to be closely related to each other, high frequencies of Salado polychrome pottery and lots of obsidian from those two sources in particular. And interestingly, uh, one of these sort of migrant enclave sites is, is uh, are, one that's, that's been argued it called the Three Up site is located right next to this Mule Creek source. So that, that's another sort of connection there. We have evidence for migrants in that area. We have evidence for other places where migrants ended up or receiving obsidian from that source. So our idea is that um, migration, as, as sort of the title you know, of, of this talk was set out, how did migration change social networks across the, the Southwest in the late pre-Hispanic period. The idea is that migrants, by arriving and sort of maintaining connections they'd already had prior to, prior to entering the Southern Southwest, created new connections between the places that, where they arrived. And these new connections connected um, people that were living in areas that had previously been sort of doing their own thing, going about their, their uh, business with considerably less interaction than we see later in time. So th this is a major shift. And Interestingly, you know, we, see, we, can, we can trace this through both ceramics and obsidian, and this really adds to this picture, picture of population coalescence and change and what's happening in the late pre-Hispanic period uh, in the Southwest in general. Thank you.
question? Are you talking mostly the Tucson area in your figures here? No, I, so I'm, I'm talking about the whole southern southwest, essentially from the Phoenix Basin areas west down okay. Papagria, Tucson, over to the San Pedro. I'm leaving out the southeastern corner of Arizona because there's some different things happening down then there. Then is this too early for the nomadic uh, tribes that were coming in and attacking? Yeah. Like if it, so this is pre-Apache and mm -hmm. all that? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Just a minute. How much of the depopulation was maybe due to lack of reproduction or moving away? Well, so both both things are probably happening. And, and one, one thing that's interesting, and you know, when you think about these long time frames, it only takes a really, really small change in the growth rate of a population. So if, if you know, just a few fewer babies per thousand are born per year, you know, that's, that's not that big a change. But when you compound that over 150 years, that can pretty quickly compound into a declining population. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a precipitous drop. And you know, as, we, as, as these maps sort of show, there is this sort of gradual decline in population. And, and I like uh, Dave Abbott and edited a book that was called Centuries of Decline, talking about the last centuries in the uh, Hoakam region before this, this, this depopulation, as we see it archaeologically. And I like that because it sort of thinks about how this was a long, drawn-out thing where people were, you know, population was slowly declining. Maybe things were getting tougher because there were more labor demands, you know. So things are changing gradually and not necessarily precipitously as we sometimes think of massive abandonments. Hi, Matt. Oh. <laughs> Hi, um, I just have a question about, I guess, the graphs. Yeah. On the graph that you're showing, um, AD 1350 to 1400, mm -hmm. um, I'm just curious, you may have mentioned it, but I, I sort of didn't completely catch it. Were some of the sites that were um, sort of isolated, the Phoenix Basin, were they the bigger sites? They were, yeah. So that's what, is that, can you spec, I mean, was that partly why they're sort of separate from yeah. the cluster? Or? It, it seems a lot of those ones that are sort of on that tail extending out, are, a lot mm -hmm. of those include some of the biggest platform mound sites in the Phoenix Basin. And, and the, the, the idea is that they're producing a lot more um, red on buff a little bit later, Casa Grande red on buff, but they also have a lot of other things that are, that are there and present. So they're not, they're not considerably different from these other things. You know, I had that 75% threshold. Yeah. They're just a little bit beyond that, mm -hmm. but still they are beyond that. And actually, that, that, that pattern, that tail, sort of the further you go out on the tail, the further west you're going. So there's sort of a spatial component okay. to that as well. So it really does seem there was sort of a limit, and this was sort of at the limit. And thing, there's a few sites that are maybe just a little bit beyond that. Yeah, so you might, they might actually be similar. It's just they're so large that... You're yeah. mapping in other things. But I, I also think, the, I mean, there, there may have been some differences in, you know, what they were engaging in and inwardly focused for, versus focused on changes that are happening across the rest of the southern southwest at the same time. Oh, cool. So Thanks. Really cool data set. Thanks. <laughs> Could you comment a little bit more about the difference in the networks between obsidian and ceramics? Sure. So... Well, the ceramic networks that we're talking about, what we're looking at is the relationship from site to site. So we're looking how similar are, is one site to the other site. The obsidian, what we're looking at is site to the source. So it's a different kind of network. We're looking at which sites are connected to which source. So what we see is that in general, um, prior to about 1300, there's not really a strong relationship between the ceramics you have and the obsidian you're getting. That's more related to geography. You know, you're getting things that are relatively close by. After this transition, for several of the sources, in, in particular the ones in the upper Gila, the Mule Creek and Cal Canyon sources, if you're obtaining lots of those after 1300, the, uh, there's a high probability that you're also either producing or obtaining lots of salado polychrome pottery. So the, the, I, I, I forget the exact number, but sites that have substantial over-representations of those sources have you know, 80, 90 percent of their painted assemblages are salado polychrome pottery. So that's the connection that we're seeing there. And other areas, uh, for example, um, areas where San Francisco mountains volcanics are showing up, which are both the northern and southern southwest, those areas are not necessarily similar in terms of the ceramics they're, they're obtaining. So some sources appear to cross these ceramic boundaries, if you, if you will, and some sources seem to mostly remain within them. Did that answer your question? Sort of. So Cro Cow Canyon and Mule Creek mm -hmm. are along a transportation corridor, is that correct? 
Well, so yeah, I mean, the, the sort of Gila River and things like that, but the one, one interesting aspect of this is, so if you go to the San Pedro River, sites that uh, are where there's really strong evidence of migrant enclaves, so like Davis Ranch, Reeve Ruin, are, are ones where people have made strong arguments for the presence of migrants. Even within the San Pedro, the entire San Pedro is getting more of this Mule Creek Obsidian after 1300. Those are getting considerably more than other sites in the San Pedro. So it really does seem to be tied to both the uh, migrants and the producers of Salado Polycom pottery in this late period. That, that isn't true the further west you go. So like if we're talking Phoenix Basin, the pattern's quite different. If um, anyone has any uh, written questions, I will pick them up and uh, ask them for you. Bill, I've got one here. Oh, go ahead. Um, oh, I'll be right over. Um, in this uh, large scale population decline that you've talked about, have there been any studies or analyses of burials, uh, in indications of disease, other, other sorts of uh, things like that as to cause? Yeah, so th there's, there's been a number of arguments that people have made about declining health uh, among uh, Hokan populations, especially in the core in the Phoenix Basin. And those are actually currently being contested. There was actually a meeting at ASU earlier today where people were talking about alternate explanations for some of these patterns or maybe suggesting that some of these strong patterns that people have used of declining health may have actually been a little bit overstated. So I think this is still something that needs to be considered more. It is something that people have been looking into, but it's, I, I think there's still a few question marks that need to be filled out on that. The one of the obviously major studies of uh, the Salado polychromes was the work by uh, Patty Crown, and are there any major uh, disagreements or contrasts with with uh, the um, work that uh, Crown did versus uh, the studies that you've been working on? So Patty Crown, her her argument did connect the origins and spread of Salado polychrome to migration from the northern southwest from many different locations into the southern southwest. A component that she talks about that I didn't really talk about here is there's sort of, Salado polychromes actually originate, the, early, the earliest varieties of these originate in an area just north of the, of the Mugion Rim in the Silver Creek area and surrounding nearby regions. And from there it seems to primarily spread in the southern southwest after, after AD 1300. So there's, there's this other aspect of this about how a possibly slightly earlier wave of migration might have been tied up in the initial emergence of this new ceramic tradition, and its spread may have been tied to the arrival of later migrants. So it's a little bit more complicated than I got into in this context here, but I think the big picture that she's arguing is relatively similar to what we're, we're discussing here. We're just trying to formalize some of these patterns uh, at a regional scale. And how about the tie between the Salado polychromes and uh, religion or ideology? Yeah, so that was a big part of what she was talking about. She, ta she talked about the sort of cult involving um, people from potentially many different backgrounds that are sort of involved in this new and widespread religious movement that, that very rapidly spread across um, much of the southern southwest. And actually, it's, it's even more extensive if you want to include areas just where Salado polychromes are found in general. It goes all the way into uh, northern Mexico, all the way up into the Zuni area um, a little bit later in time. So her argument you know, very much jives with ours that, that some of these, the, the, the importance of this and potentially uh, religious or social transformation that's occurring in this place is, is largely responsible for this rapid and, and widespread distribution. Am I missing someone? Um, raise your hand if you've got, what, are, Matt, you've uh, talked at, um, <coughs> at some point in the past in a conversation, I, I know that, uh, there's a, indications of movement of polychromes suddenly into the Zuni area. Yeah. Is, is that, uh, that's an indication of a fairly long distance move. Any yeah. uh, comment or elaboration on that sure. process? Sure, so, so, so the, Zuni, the Zuni region at about AD 1400, um, there'd been a number of villages that are located east up the Zuni River and into the El Moro Valley into the late 1300s. Around 1375 or 1400, there's the, these new villages are established on um, the lower reaches of the river, a little bit closer to the um, New Mexico-Arizona border, and basically where the Pueblo Azuni is today. And there's a lot of material cultural changes that happen with that move. So all of a sudden, you know, there's this shift in village location. The organization of villages are really different. They, previously, they'd been building these large planned villages where 
rooms were laid out in this very uniform pattern, and the ones that are building after 1375 are sort of haphazard with rooms uh, placed on in, in different patterns, and they're built in small segments. And along with this, we also see the arrival of Salado Polychrome, which had never been uh, in the Zuni region prior to this. So all of a sudden, we see the emergence of Salado Polychrome. Most of it probably was not made there. There's, there's a little bit of disagreement about that. But what we do know is in context where we have good stratigraphic information, it's a very short period of time where the Salado Polychrome is present there. And one of the main contexts where it's present, where it's present at Zuni is in uh, burial context. And the uh, Pueblo of Hawiku was excavated in the early 20th century. And there was a large burial population excavated. And I think about a third of the burials were cremations, which is, which is unique for that time period in the Zuni region. That's not something you see prior to that. And many of these cremations are associated with these Roosevelt Redware uh, Salado polychrome vessels, which are new to the area. So the idea, and this is actually backed up with some additional biological evidence that have been, that have been put forward in, in, in other studies, is that this period of time represent, represented an arrival of people from the southern southwest back to the northern southwest. So in some ways, you could argue this is sort of a return migration of people that might have been among the, the, the descendants of people who had come south earlier in earlier generations. The large uh, coalescent communities and Southwest Social Networks database uh, has now been amassed, and some questions have been addressed. Are there new, uh, what's, what are the new directions, new questions that um, you or others might be uh, looking toward? Yeah, I think, you know, it's an ever-changing database. We're always getting new information. It's always improving. And I think one of the things that we really need to do is to really dig into specific areas and see where we where this can be approved, if we can uh, better regional chronologies within specific parts of the Southwest, to see if these regional scale patterns that we're arguing for at this really, really big picture play out differently or, or, or the same as, as we might expect in specific places. So I think, you know, drilling down to specific places is, is one way of looking at this. Another way is to sort of push it back earlier in time. And this is something we, we've been talking about with work that we're involved in focused on the Chacoan era in the uh, Southwest. And we're, we're currently hoping to start a new project using some of these same methods and sources of information that I talked about here, going all the way back to the 8800 in the Chaco region and extending and linking up with the current database I talk about here. So I, I think, you know, really drilling into specific places and also pushing it back and, and in new directions will be important ways this can develop in the coming years. You might just make a brief point about the availability of this uh, access to the database. Yeah, so we, we have user agreements uh, for, you know, professional researchers that have research aims that they want to use this for, and we have, so that people can use and use this on their own and, you know, for their own research agendas and, and goals. So, you know, we encourage you to contact us if you have sp some specific projects in mind and things like that, so. Matt, Mike. just a quick clarification. On those three uh, charts that you have across the top of page yeah. two, um, I understand the colors, the lines, and the sizes of the, the images. Yeah. But you also have circles and squares. Is there yeah. a difference? So the squares, the squares are sites with uh, platform mounds. So yeah, I, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned that. So cir circles are sites without, and cir squares are sites with platform mounds. If there's no more questions, thank you very much. Whoops, 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 hold myself. <laughs> One more question. Uh, maybe several. Uh, in looking at this, I study the Chacoan a lot. In looking at this, the northern abandonment would have taken place after that 1270 to, 1270 to 1290 severe drought. Yeah. Um, but the the drought also happened down here, but the Hohokam are still here strong up until 1400 when they finally go. Um, why did I don't study Hohokam very much? Why did the Hohokam last so long? Do you know? Well, so I mean, there, there's a few things that are going on. There's a that's a complex question, and there's a lot of ways that this could be answered. But you know, different places are going to have different responses to these big regional climatic changes, for example. But one of the other things is that people are irrigating, you know, they're using large-scale canal irrigation in the south, so they're not necessarily directly tied to rainfall right on top of them. You know, it's, it's when it's raining up in the watershed of the river much further away, because they're able to capture sort of a lot of water 
through this. And people have actually done st stream flow reconstructions for the Salt uh, River. And you can tell you know, times a period where there would have been lots of water available in the river and times when there might not have been as, as much. And actually, we do see some population fluctuations in relation to those at some times and places, but all, not all times. So you know, a, a drought or whatever you want to call it happening in a context where there's not that many people and they have plenty of food is really different than a drought taking place in a time when there's lots of people and maybe they're on the edge of what they can support already. So I think we also need to take into account the social situations and how people were organizing themselves and into those models that link environmental determinants to uh, things like population movement or depopulation. But doesn't that stream flow analysis show that during that 23-year drought, it was severely dry here and then followed up by two years of severe flooding? I don't that know would have had a big impact. I don't know the specifics, but I mean, I, there are you know models linking the the boom and bust and the flooding and periods of aggradation, degradation, and the stream and the stream uh, in the area to population movement. I'm I'm sorry that I don't know the specifics on that particular question. Okay. We got one more here. Let me give. Um, what's supposed to be the religious basis of the pottery, the, the speculation? So, there's, a, there's a lot of, so Patty Crown and others have argued that a lot of the imagery that's related to this is all related to water and things like that. So there's a lot of animals and snakes and things like that, rattles, things that are related to water uh, in contemporary groups. And also these things appear to have been used in feasting context. So they're, they're, they have these big painted designs on the exterior so that you know when a vessel was full, they'd still be quite visible on the outside. And uh, it's been argued that you know these are made to be seen, sort of. So you know if you're using these in a public context, they're they're quite large. Often, this may suggest that you know you know we're a member of the same group, we believe in the same thing. You know you're sort of displaying this overtly. So those are the kinds of connections people have made. So both the iconography that's found on them, and also contextual uh, characterizations of how they're probably being used at this time. Thank you. Looks like we're getting a few more questions here. Thanks. <laughs> Uh, regarding the religious component, how does that uh, account for differences between all these regions in ceremonial architecture and site layout? Yeah, that's actually a really interesting aspect of this salado phenomenon in general, is that all, some of these things do cross-cut different kinds of uh, religious architecture that, already, that had already been there. And you know, I think especially as you get a little bit later in time, so not, not sort of right after 1300, but maybe 1350, 1375 and later, even these ceramic vessels start to take on characteristics of local ceramic traditions. So like in, in the eastern portion of the, uh, where the Salado ends up, smudging the inside of vessels, so sort of putting this black coating on the inside, was something that had been really common for ceramics for a long period of time, absent from Salado polychrome. And the late varieties that are found in that same area later, that that's sort of starts to show up. So this may suggest that there might be some sort of combinations of local traditions and also this new thing that had swept the southern southwest relatively rapidly. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a key point that this, the public architectural features, and this is something that, you know, archaeologists that are uh, talking about these models sometimes try to pretend like doesn't exist, you know, that there, there are these differences and similarities in public architecture that cross cut this widespread cer ceramic phenomenon. But I, the way I think about this is it's something that was really picked up by a lot of people that had a lot of different backgrounds, but they were all participating in something together at the same time. So I think it, it can be seen, you, you can see those divisions, but this is also linking them together in that way. Going once, Gene. Do you have any ideas why Hopi and Zuni um, were able to survive in the north, and did they participate in this uh, Salado polychrome? Yeah, so so Hopi did not, and Zuni, like I said, at, just at the very end, there's the arrival of people that are bringing these Salado polychrome vessels, but it's never a major part of what they're making and doing there. And they're interesting because they both do persist, and one thing that we see is that, you know, they're relatively, you know, if you look at uh, um, the population maps, they're relatively isolated. They're about, you know, I don't know what it is, 150 um, apart. And then, you, you, but you can see there's not a whole lot of people in between them. But they, when, what they were doing in terms of interaction with people out on the landscape was quite different. So Hopi, uh, people in the Hopi region were making Hopi yellowware, Jedido yellowware, which ended up in a lot of places in central Arizona and a lot of places 
in the you know petrified forest down into Silver Creek and areas along the rim, Zuni, people in the Zuni region were producing Zuni glazeware pottery that sort of contracted through time. So it's it's getting it's not going out on the landscape nearly as much as this this Hopi yellowware pottery. So Zuni seems to be really in, insular and inward looking, and Hopi at first at least seems to be producing this commodity that people are receiving in lots of different places. But so there, there's sort of two different responses, you know, one sort of outward looking, one sort of inward looking. But these are the places that end up, you know, uh, retaining over the long run. And I think one of the things, Zuni is an area that I've worked in. Uh, that was where my dissertation work was. And, and one of the things that's interesting about that area is it's an area that's characterized by a lot of flexibility. So people through time are just always really, really flexible in where they're living on the landscape, how frequently they're moving, you know, what agricultural strategies they're using. So I think that was really, you know, a great adaptation for them in that environment, just to be flexible and always be willing to change, you know. So when I talked about this movement uh, where the new Zuni villages were established in and around where Zuni is today into the areas of the west of the New Mexico border, that in that same time, they're also picking up irrigation a lot more than they had been previously. They've been doing it along some seeps and springs previously, but they're, that's becoming a much larger portion of how they're feeding themselves in this new environment that's actually topographically different. So you have to, you have to use different strategies. So I think flexibility may be one potential answer to that question. Can you tell that whether there's a difference between uh, the population actually moving or just very advanced trade routes, uh, traders that really got around a lot? Yeah, so one of the ways that we like to do this is, you know, people tend to make and use their sort of everyday objects, things like cooking pots or like the way they make a hearth in a room. They tend to make and use things that they you know, grew up using the way they learned to do them. And this, there's a lot of sort of ethnographic research across the world that suggests that certain things are strongly patterned this way. So if we see, you know, just this fancy pottery, just this painted pottery showing up at these new places, but we don't see these things like, uh, you know, the hearths are the same as they were back, no, back home. And, you know, they're making pottery in exactly the same way in terms of how they're coiling were the same as they did back where they came from then it might suggest that we have just the ceramics moving and it's exchanged. But if we see both those things, that suggests that it's people and materials. So, Thank you very much, Matt. Thank you.